All right, so we'll continue with Middle English. Um, we got uh, the external influences covered last time, and uh, today we'll be looking at internal changes, internal internal changes in language um, that also happened. There are four handouts here, and for those viewing this, uh, these handouts will be posted on on Blackboard. So um, we'll continue with Middle English, and uh, this is just kind of like a quick overview here. I have, um, we've, we've been looking at the change. Remember when we had covered Proto-Indo-European and when we were transitioning to Germanic, we talked about the main things that happened. There were a lot of things that were mentioned, but Grimm's Law was one of the important changes from Proto-Indo-European to Germanic because that influenced only the Germanic languages. Then uh, from Old English to Middle English, we will be looking at these, uh, these changes. We already looked at, uh, looked, at, looked at some of them. There was the loss of the sound adoption of zh sound uh, based on French uh, influence, actually, external influence there. And um, then uh, the allophonic variants. Uh, uh, in Old English, we ended last last uh, class in looking at these. Uh, the uh, voiceless fricatives had allophones, voiced counterparts, but uh, those voiced counterparts then in Middle English, they gained phonemic status. So they gained the power of changing the meanings. And your homework assignment, which I think I posted last Thursday already, so uh, it's it's there already. It's a red link for homework assignment. This is homework assignment number three already. So uh, that is about the phonemization of the voiced fricatives during Middle English. The voiced fricatives v, v, and z became phonemic. Also. Uh, the n, uh, which was an allophone of n, so the velar nasal was just an, an allophone of the alveolar nasal n, but it gained also phonemic status, and that's an important thing that happened uh, happened and has had happened between Old English and Middle English. Another very important, by the way, I, I've posted the. PowerPoint, we've got a lot of like messy looking scribbles on the slides. So everything's posted. The PowerPoint has been posted on Blackboard already. So uh, so you can you can go and uh, go and look at that. So don't feel that you have to write everything down. You can if you want to, of course. So um, another important change uh, that had repercussions for how English is today was the reduction of vowels um, in non-stressed positions. And that led then subsequently to the loss of the final schwa. So vowels first became schwas at the end of words, and then the schwa completely disappeared. And that's the story behind the so-called silent E uh, in English words that uh, that little kids are kind of like struggling to figure out why do we have to write this e there at the end of the word because it doesn't sound like anything. So uh, so this is the story behind it. So uh, the loss of endings, then the loss of case endings, because old English had had inflectional endings, uh, that led to a much more rigid word order in Middle English. So English was starting to approach this very strict subject, verb, object, word order. And at the same time, it needs to be compensated by something. And that compensation was then the adding of the use, increasing the use of prepositions, for instance. So uh, because prepositions were not as prevalent, in Old English at all, a lot of the prepositions were 
developed from adverbs, for instance. But um, in Middle English, more and more prepositions got to be used. Um, that was a big, big change in terms of the typology of the English language. And then I have added here, because this is not just, I want you to kind of see that we're going all the way to Proto-Indo-European, through Germanic, through Old English, through Middle English, but then there's still Early Modern English and Present Day English to come. Uh, so from Middle English to early, early Modern English, and we won't talk about this today, but we will talk about uh, it next time when we uh, are covering Early Modern English. That's the uh, between between about Early Modern English from um, from actually usually. Uh, demarcated as starting at 1500, but this particular change, the Great Vowel Shift, it already started like 1300, uh, and it was pretty much finished by 1600. S and then there were also, in early modern English, simplification of some initial consonant sequences. We don't talk about knees anymore, or we don't knock on the door, and uh, Knights are not riding, riding to rescue the princesses or what have you. We talk about knees and knock and knight. So the initial consonant cluster in, in early modern English times, it was simplified and uh, also other kinds of consonant clusters were simplified. So for instance, we don't say hlav, we say loaf. We don't say hring, we say ring, and we don't say that was wrong, we say wrong, <laughs> or wrong. Uh, so, uh, so kind of like putting the, the Middle English changes, and now let's uh, into, into perspective of what came before, change continues to happen, it continues to happen today, and, uh, and then now uh, zooming in onto what happened from Old English to, to um, Middle English, starting to really focus on that, which was just that middle part here in that previous slide. So the big change is uh, in English that from a synthetic inflecting language that was Old English, English gradually became, and actually quite fast during Middle English times, it became an analytic language. An analytic language depends on word order and particles to express grammatical relations. What is the subject? What is the direct object? There's no ending to show. Even though, you know, we always mention this, uh, in the pronoun system there still is a, a different case ending. Uh, I, uh, she saw, uh, she saw him, but he saw her. So depending on whether it's the subject, you, you choose he and she, and if it's the object, you should choose him and her. So the pronoun system kind of like drags along this interesting uh, Old English uh, and, and prior case uh, ending distinction. But all the other nouns have lost it. I mean, all the, all the nouns have lost it. All the, all the other nominals except for pronouns. So why does a language change so radically? If you look at Old English, it has much fewer of these short little words with which present-day English is full of prepositions and particles and, and so on. And, uh, and uh, why does this kind of a change happen? Uh, both external and internal. External influences and internal change, they contribute to this kind of a typological, radical change from one type of language to another type of language. And one of the external influ influences was uh, during, during Middle English times, and starting from Old English, that they were basically, especially during Middle English times, that's what we're talking about now. Uh, there were three different languages spoken in England. English, of course, and then French brought by the Normans, and then Scandinavian 
to a certain extent. Could this be one of the reasons why language starts to change? And the answer is it's part of the part of the reasons. It's part of the, it's it's part of the trigger, not the not the sole change. Because we can have languages, several different languages being spoken in the same country and they don't necessarily influence each other and other uh, and don't necessarily influence this kind of a radical change from a synthetic language to an analytic language that happened to English. Another uh, reason or contributing factor, not a reason, but contributing factor was the reduction of these uh, unstressed vowels uh, to schwa uh, in uh, unstressed positions. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that is, uh, is, is typical of Germanic because remember in Germanic uh, the stress went already before that it, it, the stress went to the, yeah, in Germanic, uh, early Germanic, the stress started to move to the front syllable, to the root syllable of the word. And that leaves then the ending of the word without a stress. It's not, it's not as salient as it used to be if it could have stress sometimes. So people don't pay attention to the endings of the word if the endings of the words do not carry crucial uh, grammatical information, like who does what to whom, <laughs> right? And in present-day German, the same kind of process is going on. Uh, the German word uh, for uh, please uh, would, would uh, show it's not said, it's not, and, and I don't really speak German, but it's not said bitte, eh. it's said you speak German, right? Yeah. Bitte. Bitte, yes. So you have a schwa here at the end, bitte. And, uh, and that's exactly what was going on in Middle English. So the endings of the words, they first became schwas, and then they became completely dropped. Because why have anything there at the end if it's just like a, right? Uh, well, Germans have still kept that, but, uh, but uh, that's again, you know, we can't really predict which way the change is going to happen. That there are tendencies, and that's what the historical linguists look at. They look at the tendencies. What is what is more likely kind of a change? Usually, simplification is more likely than than complexification, uh, and uh, and analogy is very strong. Your textbook gives a really good account of uh, with examples of analogical change. So that's also an internal language change. Okay, in Old English already the word order was more rigid than in many other Indo-European languages. So Old English started to already show this prediction of going to subject, verb, object, word order. And um, and uh, already prepositions and other particles, they were doing the job of inflections, and they were started, starting to do the job of inflections much, much more in Middle English. Okay. So um, here is uh, a little bit more elaboration on the factors for the loss of inflectional suffixes. First of all, if you look at the Old English uh, word uh, noun inflection paradigm, there was almost no paradigm that contained the maximum amount of differentiation between the different cases. So, you know, you distinguish between masculine, feminine, neuter, you distinguish in, in Old English between plural and singular, and you distinguish between uh, between the cases, nominative, accusative, genitive, and dative. And almost no paradigm, if you look at your book, um, you know, we go back to the old English noun paradigms. Um, just quickly, for instance, on page 
143, if you want to look, there's the paradigm for name, for instance. Uh, that was nama, naman, 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 namena, namum, naman. So how many times do we have, how many different forms do we have here? There is, there is the potential of, you know, changing, uh, having eight different endings, eight different forms of the word nama for singular versus plural, and then the four different cases in both singular and plural. But how many, how many different forms do we see? We could have eight, but there are only four. Yes, there are only four. Nama um, is for singular nominative, and naman, 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 five times it's covering singular genitive, dative, and accusative, and uh, nominative and accusative plural. So, so this is what is meant by the fact that almost no paradigm contained the maximum amount of differentiation. This kind of a system becomes useless in distinguishing grammatical relations because why have the ending if, if it doesn't do its full job? <laughs> so um, grammatical relations are these relations when, which express who does what to whom, with what instrument, when, where, why, and how, and, uh, and you use different cases, like you did that, did, did that exercise about the, why a different case is used in this particular instance. And, um, and it was still, a system that was um, used quite a bit in, in Old English, but it starts to crumble because this is one of the factors that it didn't 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 differentiate in a maximum way. The second one we already talked about the heavy stress went in Germanic, it went to the root syllables, and that left the vow vowels in the suffixes uh, without a stress, which led to the fact that they were reduced to schwa, this mid-central neutral vowel, which doesn't, doesn't uh, require uh, the, the articulation of, you know, pulling the, um, advancing the tongue, the body of the tongue, rounding the lips, uh, lifting or lowering the body of the tongue. So you just open your mouth and out comes a uh, 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 schwa. So uh, that's the easy way to pronounce. And you know, why pronounce it in, 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 a, in, a, in an elaborated uh, way that takes more effort in the mouth uh, if, uh, if the, the endings don't really send a lot of information, okay? Another uh, thing that happened was uh, Old English uh, case endings often ended in n or m, and these would eventually merge and drop away completely. Uh, n, the alveolar nasal, took over m, the bilabial nasal. So we lost this, this m in the endings everything ended in n, and then that was dropped also, okay, because it doesn't do the distinction, which like for instance, the dative plural was always um in Old English, and then that merged uh, together with other cases. The third reason uh, of factor, not reason, but contributing factor, uh, was word order that was already relatively fixed in Old English, and it indicated grammatical relations. So syntax was a backup system for this uh, case system that didn't make maximum number of distinctions anymore. And fourth factor was an external factor. Uh, loan words from Old Norse and French were coming into English, and especially from, from French after the Norman conquest. And it is easier to adopt a long word if you don't have to figure out how to inflect it in your, in your own language. There's always, because a long word is uh, it's, uh, phonetically uh, uh, 
different. It may sometimes seem odd to add a native ending to a French long word, for instance. So, uh, so that kind of, even though people, bilingual people do that all the time, uh, they, they take a word, um, word uh, from another language. And like I have looked at Finnish English code switching, the mixing of Finnish and English in bilingual speech. And Finns take words from English all the time and they just add the Finnish inflectional endings. Finnish is very um, uh, inflectional, so um, to say the least. So uh, it, 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 it's done, but sometimes it leads to kind of like, hmm, uh, because especially if the phonology of the word is, uh, that has constraints from grammatical point of view. And also from like you know social point of view, if you if you uh, do do it in situations where you are not supposed to be mixing English words uh, among like for instance monolingual speakers, that's those were the four main factors that contributed to this huge change. So let's look at this in more detail. So uh, today um, we have words that uh, end in E, uh, the letter E, but it's never pronounced, so we talk about Dale, and Pale, and Male, and Tail, and no, that's Tail, yeah, T-A-L-E, that would work. I'm thinking about a cat's tail, but that's, that's not a silent E. Uh, never mind. So uh, these words, uh, and in, in English we, you know, you could think of a lot of other examples, but we don't we don't pronounce this e. So now we are looking at the story behind the silent e in English. So if you ever teach this stuff, you can say, well, we write this e because it was one day it was actually pronounced as a full vowel, and uh, may have been another other vowel too. So what we have here is uh, three columns. Old English, Early Middle English, and Late Middle English. So we need to look at Early Middle English because that worked differently than Late Middle English because change is going on. So we have four words which are heart, mild, soon, and strength. So herte uh, in Old English, milde, sona, and strengthu. You notice that these words, two of them end in a in Old English, and that a was pronounced as a pure vowel. Heorte, well, at least as far as we know. Heorte, milde, sona, strengthu. So we have a, a, u at the ends of these words. Well, in early Middle English, uh, these words uh, became all to be pronounced with a schwa at the end. So e, a, u, very different vowels. A, a fr mid front vowel, a, a low uh, back vowel, u, a rounded high back vowel. They all became a uh, at the end of the word where there was no stress. So they became herte, milde, sone, strengthe. radical change. Even more radical change happened when this schwa at the end got dropped altogether. So in late Middle English these words were already hert, heart, mild, mild, son, son, and strength. Same as in present day English. So uh, that kind of, you know, summarizes the, the big, big change. So the vowels first collapsed into schwa, and then that schwa was dropped completely. By the end of the Middle English period, about 1500, English had only a handful of leftover inflections. And uh, the loss of grammatical gender also happened. The grammatical gender was uh, replaced by biological gender. So no longer, and, and like, you know, in today, today's English, we don't make a distinction of 
a noun being a masculine, feminine, or, or neuter noun, uh, we still have a, like a remnant of, of, of biological gender uh, defining the choice of the word, even though this is going away when we try not to think about people's gender so much, so we don't talk about actresses versus actors and lions versus lionesses and and so on, but um, but that's what, what what was happening already during um, <clears throat> Middle English. What was left is um, is only two cases. So we have the possessive case and non-possessive case. Uh, non-possessive case is it's the combination of what in old English was nominative and accusative and dated. They all collapsed to the same form like they are today. But possessive persisted. And your book really has a good, uh, good explana explanation and exploration into why certain cases persisted as opposed to some other cases. So read that with, uh, with uh, care. I was going to say read that with interest, but I can't, I can't tell anyone to read with interest. That has to come from the heart. <laughs> anyway, so read it. Adjectives, they, they also had lost all inflections and the distinction between weak and strong adjectives. And I hope we have time to get that far in the, in the slides and talk a little bit about how it still was in uh, Middle English and how it was crumbling away. Uh, verbs, uh, the personal endings were also reduced in the verbal system. So it was a radical change going on during Middle English times. Okay, let's look at the personal pronouns in, uh, in present day English, moving away from just like these general remarks of what, of what happened to the noun and verb system. But basically the general, general remark is that the inflectional system simplified radically, uh, collapsed and, uh, and uh, endings were first reduced and then dropped together altogether. So let's look at the personal pronouns. In Middle English, there was a huge number of variation, amount of variation in, in Middle English, because Middle English was, um, was strong in dialectal variation. There, there was a lot of different dialects. You, you uh, traveled on your horse, of course, uh, a few miles, and you ended up in another village, and they spoke a little bit differently from, from how the people spoke in your village. So, uh, so that's why we, in the texts that we, of course, we have many more texts available. The language was not standardized yet, so that there was no, no, uh, nobody saying, okay, this is how we are, we are we're going to be writing, uh, writing the personal pronouns, for instance. So you find a lot of different kinds of, uh, kinds of forms. So uh, I, in uh, Middle English, the first person singular pronoun was either itch or e. And of course, in Old English, it was itch. So it, uh, that persisted still in some dialects. And some maybe registers when people would have been talking a little bit more formally. We don't have enough, enough data on that, but, uh, but we can assumed that that was going on, of course, but it, it simplified. You dropped the final affricate there at the end, so itch became e in many dialects, and that's what it is today, except then the great vowel shift changed the e into i. The object form was me, just like in today, except we talk about me, and possessive form, it was mean, mean, or me. Then the first person plural, which is we, we have we, us, and our, and so did, so did uh, Middle English, except they pronounced it a little bit differently. We, us, and ur. And ure was also used uh, as a variant of the first person plural pronoun. The second person, uh, person singular, you, uh, was thu, thu, Thou, and there were other forms I just wrote, etc., because there were too many to list here that you can find in texts 
the object form was there and there, uh, and there is really no difference here except the writing. Uh, the th was uh, the spelling. Th was something that was introduced uh, uh, during Middle English times, and that replaced the thorn. And uh, that's that's basically the the difference. So it was thou or thou pronounced uh, or thou uh, then later on, but not yet that. Did I pronounce it thou? That was wrong. So it was do, and there, and there. <laughs> okay, possessive, thin, thine, the, all written with the th instead of the thorn. Second person plural, you all, uh, you many people, was written either with the yog or y, and it was pronounced ye, yeah. and uh, it was also you or u. Ooh, or you or you or I, I can't do all these uh, Middle English dialects but you get the point that there was a lot of variation possessive jure or jure and, and that's those uh, pronouns and uh, let's look at the third person because we didn't look at those yet so third person he, she, it and they three forms, subject form, object form, and possessive, and a lot of variation, not in the masculine, but in the feminine, and in the third person, plural, they, them, and their. A lot of different, different dialectal variation and variation, and this is not even, it's just listing like a fraction, fraction of it. But the third person masculine, singular, it was the same as it is today already in Middle English. So uh, he was pronounced he, he, him, and his. And then we have the feminine where there's an awful lot of variation because this is the time when she, the pronoun she, pronounced the she, it was starting to take over. But the old English forms had been he and he, and then the she, it was written in different ways. So it was shaw, written with the yog, and uh, she, and uh, my personal favorite, ho, referring to third person singular feminine. Uh, object forms, hire, hure, her, her, etc. And uh, possessive forms, hir or hire, her, her or her. Then the neuter, it, it was hit or it. And we talked last time that you may have heard some people uh, still say hit. Hit don't matter no more. <laughs> hit don't matter none, no more, something like that. So hit. Uh, object forms, hit and it, uh, or him. Uh, note that that was the same, that option was the same as with the masculine. And then his was the same as with the masculine. It's developed later by analogy, but it wasn't used in Middle English yet. And then the plural, a lot of variation for they. So it was he, he, they, uh, borrowing from Scandinavian, they, ho, he, thy, and so on. Object forms, today's them, Hem, them, hum, hem, thym, them, and so on. You, you see that the ones with the thorns are the Norse uh, borrowings. And possessives, here, thyr, heore, hore, thar, and so on. <laughs> so you get, the, you, you get the point about this variation. And, uh, and it's the richness of language, but it was kind of like suppressed when language started to be printed and you have to, you know, have universal ways of referring to he, she, it, and we, and us, and so on. Okay, but uh, a, a, an example of the varieties, non-standard varieties and their logic, um, non-standard varieties in English uh, have these plural forms, use and y'all, you all, youngs, 
uh, in depending on the dialect area. We here in Texas we say y'all all the time. I always remember when my daughter came uh, back uh, home from school after we had moved here from California, and she had been here for three weeks in um, in school and uh, came back home and said, "Mom, I really don't want to." use y'all, but it's so convenient, <laughs> and it is convenient because um, because what we have in the present day English uh, pronoun paradigm is a, a built in ambiguity. We have different words for I and it, she and he, we and they, but you singular and you plural are the same forms, and that creates an ambiguity which Old English and Middle English didn't have. In Old English, these forms, let's read these so you get some, I, I hear your voice also. So in Old English, the paradigm went itch, so, and remember in Old English, it was pronounced as the voiceless, so, so, good. Hit, he, or he, where, yeah, yeah. Here. Yeah. Here. Okay. And uh, you notice that tho and ye yeah are two different forms. If I speak to one person, it's tho in Old English. It's still tho and tho in, in Middle English. And the plural is ye. Yeah. So let's read the Middle English one. Itch, e. Itch, e. Thu, thu. Thu, thu. It, she, he. It's and so on. Where? Where? Yeah. 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 Here, they. Here, they. So in Middle English, these uh, small grammatical, short grammatical words, the thu became thu. So in Middle English, that started to be pronounced as a uh, voice. So you see that uh, thu and thu and ye. Yeah, in, in Middle English still, it made the distinction of whether I'm saying this to one person or y'all. <laughs> okay, so the non-standard varieties have dealt with this really nicely by differentiating it. And uh, that's, that's an interesting <coughs> internal fix that uh, these varieties uh, have done. Okay, uh, a few words about Middle English lexicon. Uh, We've talked about the highly analytic grammar. Uh, the Middle English had start, started to have, started to became highly ana analytic, and an immense lexicon. So these are the two characteristics of Middle English uh, analytic grammar, uh, relying a lot on word order and little particles and prepositions, and an, and a huge lexicon, uh, which was the result of borrowing and especially borrowing from French during the Middle English times. New terms and synonyms were added, and this led to this richness of English. Uh, these synonyms were raw material for an intricate system of levels of vocabulary and different styles. So, uh, for instance, we have the, uh, the old English terms for peg, and cow and sheep, but if you go to the restaurant, uh, what does pig become? Pork. And cow becomes? Beef. Yes, and uh, sheep becomes? Is a kind mutton. of a yeah. Yeah. Mutton. 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 Yes. Mutton. So, uh, so you know, we uh, imagine going to a restaurant and saying, "I would like to eat cow," <laughs> and uh, I mean that's how it would have been in yeah. you know, <laughs> old English. But uh, then we got these fancy French terms, oh. and uh, and it's somehow, I mean, it's a, in a way, it's a euphemizing thing. You kind of want to distance it. Distance yourself from the fact that you are eating a thing on your plate that used to be a living, breathing thing, grazing on the pasture and being happy there, and then it was killed and now I'm eating it. So we don't want to call it with a name that <laughs> reminds us 
uh, from um, what it is, really, I mean, so in a way. But, uh, but uh, this huge vocabulary, this is just one example. Did you, by the way, watch that little? Yes, that's what I <laughs> So I, I put it there with trigger warning because they go to the early modern English times and dictionary making and, and uh, having all kinds of different words for body parts and so on. But, uh, but uh, it is, uh, it's, it's, I've, I've watched it like multiple times and I always laugh. Um, so uh, so they, they talk about this, that you know, sheep goes to the plate and it becomes mutton. I think lamb is also something that is sometimes used, even though that is an old English um, term also. So, uh, so we have these levels of style that this immense vocabulary allows us to do. I think I may have already given the example of, you know, upon exiting, uh, extinguish the illumination instead of turn off the lights when you leave. So different stylistic levels. Uh, expanded lexicon, it marked the beginning of the cosmopolitan nature of English. So. Uh, uh, of course, we borrow from foreign languages when we borrow concepts from that foreign uh, culture and, and that expands our horizons, makes it a little bit more cosmopolitan. Um, loss of inflections made borrowing a little bit easier. We already talked about that. And the language influences on Middle English, uh, it still was Scandinavian. Uh, for instance, we have an old Norse, ter Norse term for sky. Uh, sku, uh, initially in Old English, and, and Helvon in Old English, referring to the same thing, but of course not identical anymore. So whenever we have uh, synonymic expressions, they tend to kind of like, so when you die, you don't go to the sky, you go to heaven, right? If you live it, right? <laughs> So uh, that's, that's the just you know an, an interesting. Also, another interesting thing about sky is that it it uh, it came after sk had become sh. So we don't say the shy is blue because it's a later borrowing. So that particular the, the change wasn't happening in Old English anymore. French was the biggest influence. Latin continues to be an in influence. And uh, of course, Celtic languages were spoken in the Celtic areas of England or, or British Isle. And uh, they haven't really influenced English a lot, even though people have said that we, we, we've taken some loan words from there, but uh, surprisingly few. And that's an indication because the Celtic languages, they were not in a so-called power position like French was. So, you know, you take, take borrowings from the power language. Um, Dutch and Low German, uh, there was connections, there were connections there and they continued to be an influence as well. Um, so, let's talk about the uh, fun stuff like strong and weak adjectives. <laughs> and why uh, in Middle English we talk about the strong and the weak adjectives is because this was kind of like one of the few things that Middle English had, had kept from Old English in terms of the inflections. So uh, Old English had strong uh, or indefinite versus weak or definite adjectives. And in Middle English, this, di this distinction vanished, except for a limited number of adjectives, limited kinds of adjectives. And those were the consonant, final, monosyllabic adjectives. One of the uh, handouts that I gave, and I will post uh, on Blackboard, is an exercise. This is not to be turned in, it's just for fun. <laughs> Right, and uh, so it kind of like uh, exercises this this particular uh, this particular feature of uh, the disappearance of uh, of the distinction between strong and weak adjectives. So, uh, what are strong and weak adjectives? Um, uh, there, there were uh, these different forms depending on where in syntactically that uh, adjective appeared. 
Uh, so only monosyllabic adjectives retained a trace of the old English adjective inflections, only monosyllabic adjectives, like blind, uh, which means blind. Uh, weak adjectives were used after a definite article, like the. Uh, a dem demonstrative adjective uh, or demonstrative pronoun, this or that. Uh, a possessive pronoun, my, his her, or a possessive noun, Mary's, or the girls. That was, so you have a something, a determiner in front of the adjective and following noun that makes that noun phrase somehow definite, like the man, this man, one man, uh, Mary's man. <laughs> so, uh, so that makes the noun phrase definite. This, this was the weak use of the adjective. And the weak use of the adjective, both in singular and in plural, ended in a, in, you know, still in Middle English, early Middle English, but uh, it started to crumble during that time. Now, uh, now the weak uh, form was also used in direct address when you say, like a vocative, like, hey, you, so you, if it were a noun phrase, it would have um, a uh, weak adjective there, if it were to have an adjective. Then the strong forms, they were uh, used if there wasn't a definite determiner in front of it, without a preceding de definite article, demonstrative or possessive, and also in predicate adjective positions. Uh, the example word here is blind, uh, so it was in the strong form, it was without the ending, but in the it's a strong singular, but in strong plural and weak and uh, weak singular and plural, it had the a ending, still in Middle English, according to the prescriptive Middle English grammar, if there were such a thing and do that exercise because it kind of it is and I'll, I'll post the answers to it also so um, one thing which is interesting is that we still today we see these things and uh, people just don't know how to use it but uh, but middle English uh, speakers already because this was one of the remnants of inflections that you have this or do I put an E at the end of that adjective, or do I not? And they started to make mistakes. So you will see in that exercise you are asked, is this the correct or incorrect form, and why? So uh, if you see, uh, of course, the, the whole thing that, it, that we say, the, as the form of ye, these are like these pretense, uh, old-fashioned, <laughs> Uh, businesses, uh, which you can, uh, I, I just went to Google and pulled these out. So um, uh, we pronounce it as yeah, but it's supposed to be the, uh, the, the, the old, the old tattoo shop, the old brother's brewery, the old pooby, <laughs> the old country florist. You've seen these somewhere. You go to a small town in, in East Texas and you are bound to find one. Find one. But people don't know how to use this because in, in some of these positions, uh, these are all after definite article, the. And uh, which form is, which one, two, three, four, which two are the correct forms? Two and Four, if you have a definite article like the in front of the adjective, that adjective is in Middle English, it was supposed to have uh, the, the uh, weak form, which has the a at the end. And so now you can be snobs and you see something without the A at the end, like the old tattoo shop and say, oh, that's wrong. Okay, we'll end there. Thank you.